We had a great opening weekend for Jeepers Creepers, and then two days later, on that Tuesday, the towers came down. And literally, the world changed, and my world changed, and um, on top of all the, uh, the horror, etc., personal and global, Jeepers got knocked right out of the top ten and never came back. And uh, it's weird to think about now, so many years later, but we'll never really know what that movie could have done because fate stepped in. I think Jeepers 2 is my 9-11 parable. And when I tell people that, they go, what? And I said, think about it. There's a community inside the bus. It's divided. There are cliques. There's a lot of violence going on among them. And then this darkness from above comes and just rips their world apart. And if you notice, the outcasts who stick together survive. It's a horrible thing, but they survive. And when I tell people, that's my way of saying, look, 9-11 scared the fuck out of us, but here's how we survive it. We don't go to the dark place. We go to the, okay, time to get together place, people. And that might be a very silly way to look at Jeepers 2, but I can't look at it any other way. It's time to stop being polite. There are two classes of people on this bus now. What the hell is that supposed to mean, huh? Two classes of people? What the will be eaten and the won't be eaten? Fuck you, Scotty. Well, the best thing about the success that occurred with the first one is whatever we hoped for, the movie transcended it. And so it took on a life of its own and moments prior to 9-11. And it was ridiculously successful over what was at the time considered a dead weekend, Labor Day weekend. And uh, the Zoetrope and United Artists and, and MGM decided that was where they wanted it. They wanted to position it uh, just at the end of the summer, see if they could get you know a, a nice uh, straggling of, of school kids and horror fans at that at that time of year. And it just took off. <laughs> I felt the directors who do sequels are telling people that they're uh, out of ideas or hard to get work or there's a rule, an unspoken rule, that you can maybe get away with two, but if you do three, you're telling people your career is basically over. He said, about to start Cheapers 3, by the way. So I thought, no. Then Francis Coppola, one of his visits here in town, said, come over to my house, I want to talk to you. And um, I said, yeah, MGM wants to do another one. Now, I just have a hit movie, basically. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go on to something else and make another hit movie. But it's not going to be Jeepers 2. And then Francis sat me down and said, okay, so what about this Jeepers 2? I said, it won't work, Francis. Number one, I built that thing into the Creeper so that this couldn't turn into Freddy 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. It's every 23 years for only 23 days. And that's when Francis said, well, then you could essentially you could do at least 22 more of them because uh, Jeepers 1 takes place over one day. He really talked me into it, and I'm not sure why. I don't think he was making any great amounts of money off the first Jeepers. I don't think either one of us did. Um, but he explained to me, he appealed to my filmmakers, look, they want to do this, and everything you had to take out of one, you can try and do in two. It's an interesting thing about two is that uh, one day he came in and he had uh, Hitchcock's lifeboat. And uh, I'm a Hitchcock fan. I'm a huge Hitchcock fan. And he goes, yeah, Mr. E, let's look at this. And he goes, that's, that's what Jeepers 2 is going to be. Now, he'd already written the script and it was the boss. And, it was, and I'm sitting there thinking, really? That's lifeboat? And, but... But the whole idea of the enclosure and the bus and just this place of being cornered and in the midst of the, these walls kind of crumbling in on you is the resilience of these characters to either outmaneuver, outscrap, 
or happily outlive the, the, the creeper. I wanted to blow up the bus. I got so tired of being in that bus. It was just, I have to be very honest. <laughs> but, um, well, it was, I mean, you were dealing with a bunch of kids instead of two kids. Um, the bus was a challenge. That bus was a real challenge. And then we did all the stuff out at uh, Tejon, Fort Tejon, up at the top of uh, the grapevine. All the exteriors are done there. And then all the interiors of that bus were done uh, at a uh, hangar in Long Beach. And we, we, all that stuff looking out and all the stuff with the creeper on top of the bus, that was all done in this massive hangar. And we literally recreated the exterior there and built the, the road out in the front. In fact, there's a couple of scenes, if you, if you look closely, you'll notice that the whole front of the bus is missing. You're looking out the front window and the whole engine compartment's gone. <laughs> we forgot to put it back in. What happened? What'd you see? What'd you see? Come on, did you see something or not? She flew away. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? What I just said. People don't fly the fuck away. Sit down, Scott. What the hell's going on out there? I said sit the fuck down and shut up, goddammit. Now! And we did shoot in this large hangar in Long Beach that was uh, really impressive how um, production created and duplicated Tejon Ranch. is like you really couldn't tell the difference, uh, except that you could get in a little cart and golf cart and go from one side to the next. It was a lot more convenient, but it was fantastic. It was, uh, it was a great, uh, it was another great experience. And, and the, the, the kind of fun part of filmmaking that um, you're creating theater, if you will, but, but what's really going on behind the scenes is, is, can be quite different than what's happening on uh, on screen, and yet at the same time, when both are cut together, the Tejons, the, sh the stuff that was shot at Tejon Ranch and the stuff at Long Beach was cut together, it, it's seamless. You can't tell the difference. I really thought, well, you could at least see what it's like to make a James Cameron movie. You can make Jeepers 2 as kind of an aliens to your alien, and we put these big set pieces in, and we pulled trucks, you ripped trucks right off the ground, and turned over school buses, and chased after, you know, I mean, we just did all this stuff that I've never had a chance to do. And I can tell you right now, after that experience, I don't want to make those kinds of movies. I want to watch them. I do not want to make them. They're incredibly tedious. There's a moment where the creeper hits the top of the school bus and all the windows blow out. That's like half a night waiting for that one shot because they're setting up air cannons and explosives inside the bus and, and you're waiting half a mile away because they're afraid that if anything explodes early, someone will get hurt and an MGM pulls up and they're sitting there standing behind your monitor wondering why all this time is going by for this one shot and you're wondering it too. It's so technical, that kind of filmmaking and every set piece in Jeepers 2, which I'm very proud of the set pieces though, um, I wish I would have done a few more digital shots to help some of the uh, set pieces, but they take time. And we had like 35, 40 shooting days. I think we went over a couple of shooting days on that one because it was just so technical. I like the first one. I think the first one is better story-wise. It's just, I, I just like that, that whole film, but look-wise, I love the look of the second one. I mean, I like the look of both of them, but the second one, second one I had a lot more manpower and a lot more tools to, to, to really achieve what we wanted to achieve. I mean, I mean, God, we were doing that night stuff. I had 75 electricians. It was a much bigger picture than one. And um, it would have been nice had we had a little more time because then we wouldn't have had to have somebody else, a uh, second unit, do the green screen. Victor and I could have stayed on top of the green screen because there was a few things that were done that um, we weren't happy with. Half its fucking head's gone. Now that we had a budget that was twice as much as the first one, I said, okay, more creeper. Let's get him up in the air flying around and, you know, airborne menace. Let's, um, let's have a community. You know, it was a brother and sister in the first one. Let's have a whole community of people. 
a community we can all relate to because we all went to high school and it had its horrible moments and its wonderful moments. But you remember all those people. <laughs> you know, you were one of them. Wanna play cock of the walk, bro? Why do I think you wanna call me something else? You wanna call me something else, Scotty? Because I don't think you get, I can see you thinking it, whether you say it or not. Randy Quaid has always been one of my favorite actors. And uh, if you look at his work, he's really fantastic. And I wrote, I wrote the dad, uh, Taggart, another character from Moby Dick, which I sprinkle throughout all of my screenplays because I still think that's probably the greatest book I've ever read. Um, Someone told me, why don't you put Randy Quaid as the, as the dad? And I thought, oh, well, Ray would be so much better. But Francis made a call, and MGM liked the name, etc. So here comes Randy Quaid and his wife. And they came in one day for a costume fitting. I shook Randy's hand, and his wife then called Francis during whatever we were doing, and suddenly they were gone, and I saw my opening and I took it. I said, guys, we're shooting in a week. Why don't we give it to the man I thought that I wrote the part for? Come on, he killed Laura Palmer, okay? If you need some sort of a whatever, he's been in all these movies, he's a wonderful actor. I first cast him in Powder as the, he's got a great scene in Powder. Um, and that's how Ray became the farmer, and he loved it so much because he got to be, he got to do something he doesn't use. Usually he's a, he's, he's a lawyer in a suit. He came running up to me one day when we were working on the, at the farm and he goes, look, I've got dirt under my fingernails. And I said, yes, yeah, see, this is something he never gets to do. And he's so wonderful in it, you know, he just has presence. We caught him on fire once, the dog bit him once. He didn't complain at all. What's the story in this thing? Whatever you've heard, probably. You expect us to think that that thing's real? Don't really care. How'd you kill it? Stabbed it right through the heart. With a big homemade harpoon. I love Ray. We've done four or five films together. And um, he's a real pleasure to work with. He's such a pro comes in, knows his dialogue, it's, it's just, he is like the ultimate actor you want to work with in, in, in regards to professionalism and, and just, he's witty, he's quick, he's funny, and he does his job, he's great, he's a good actor. Are there any landmarks near you? Are you close to anything? Yeah, I'm close to peeing my fucking pants, man. Can you just please tell me that you're on the way? I can't really judge the strength of your signal, but it doesn't sound close. Ray had, you know, he was a, a raged, an enraged, vengeful dad out to get this thing that committed this unspeakable act to his kid. And, you know, in the hands of maybe somebody um, of, of lesser stature, you could have gone through those emotions in a minute. But he maintained something that kept it going. And... Um, and in fact, we even had fun with some of it. There's a scene where he's um, uh, anvil, where he's anviling the um, the spear, and I think what it was, I don't know. I think the dailies had like you know whatever a number of takes and no more than six to ten wax on the on the anvil, and Victor turned that into just a symphony of him whacking away at that thing. <laughs> Francis says I cut out the scariest scene in the script, um, which was the boys. Uh, everyone's on the bus, and they hear their head coach, not Tom, but Tom, uh, they hear the head coach calling for help. He dropped me, and I'm hurt out here, and they have this huge discussion about who's going to go across the field and help the coach, and a small faction of them get off the bus to go help, and then we roll over. You see the coach under the moonlight going like this, 
help, I'm hurt, and then you pull him back, and the creature has his hand up the coach, using him like a ventriloquist doll, doing the coach's voice and saying, help me, come over here and help me. And by the time they get too close, it's all over for them, and there's a chase back to the bus, but there's all this, and it gave the creeper another gift, the gift of ventriloquism. <laughs> Shower curtain. This thing's like a fucking piece of toilet paper. <laughs> We had to make some adjustments for the face opening, which I'm not a fan of in the second one because it was a, it was a shortcut. Um, in the first one, we had three different stages where we had to shoot each one each day. So, okay, here's your three seconds of the creeper today where it goes like this, and here's your three seconds of the creeper today where it's like this, and these move. Um, by two, which was about, I don't, I don't know, two, three years later, Technology had gotten better, but I didn't want to burn up three days, so they created a different kind of cowl that opened up. I call it the Scarlet O'Hara. And you know what? That's, of course, the, um, those are the pictures that appeared on the cover of Fangoria and some other ones. The ones MGM promised me would never be published because I said, he looks like Scarlet O'Hara, okay, with a big red bonnet on him, which was not the thingy-dingy. We shot it and lit it differently, but it doesn't open up in the good old-fashioned way in that first one where he... His face opens up and he lets out that pig squeal. It's just so powerful. We couldn't get back there for the second one. So we made some special makeup effects changes for that, mostly for time. It can smell something in people, in their fear, something that helps it pick people out. Pick people out from what? I don't understand how you would know that, sweetie. A dead boy told me. Minxie has her first dream on the bus, and she's on the Taggart farm, and everything's happening backwards behind her um, while Justin comes out of the cornfield up to her. And the reason that I love this is one of the things I learned in high school, where you, when you have no money for visual effects and you're shooting in Super 8, where if you shoot upside down, then when the film gets processed, it's right side up, but everything's going to be in reverse. So I told Donnie this, I said, we're gonna shoot this whole shot upside down so that, uh, and we're gonna make Minxie act backwards and everyone else, you know, the boy chases a dog in the background, etc. I'm very proud of that moment because that is a total high school popsicle stick special effects moment, only it's an anamorphic where, how'd they do that? She's forward, but he's back. And it's not a digital effect or anything. It's just one of those good old fashioned dollar 98 special effects that you learn to do when you're a kid. Every 23rd spring for 23 days, it gets to eat. I have written a Jeepers 3 that actually is Jeepers 1.2. And that is that it happens in the three days between Jeepers 1 and Jeepers 2. And it is absolutely the most interesting Jeepers 1 we've seen, and it's got some terrifying set pieces in it, but it is, it's a great drama, and there's another, there's a young girl at the center of it, and the creeper moving his way toward the north, wherever he disappears at the end of his 23 days. It's the havoc that he wreaks on this small um, farming community in the two days between the school bus and um, flying away with Justin out of the police station, and it's really great. We thought it was trying to come in, but this freaking thing was making sure we couldn't get out. The premiere was at the Egyptian Theater in L.A., and uh, it was it was great. Um, it, was, it had been decorated with lots of corn everywhere around that courtyard in front of the theater, and uh, it was it was great seeing everyone again all of us getting together again. It was uh, the familiar feeling you get with when you're part of a large cast that where everyone just really likes each other and, um, and gets along really well. It was, it was terrific. And it was great to see the film with a theater f full of people and, and go on that ride along with them. And it, that's you know one of the most gratifying things about doing this work, you know, having, going on the ride with people and seeing the results have the intended effect. So it was fantastic, you know, and I had family and friends um, come along with, so it was 
it was it was a blast. I'm very lucky to have been able to make these two films. You probably couldn't have told me that back when I was making them because you're a different person. You know, you experience what you experience. I'm not ashamed of either one. In fact, as monster movies go, I think the Jeepers movies, we worked hard to make them more than just a monster movie, and I think that's why people really kind of um, turn on to them. Um, and the thing I'm most proud of is that when people do recognize me from making ofs or something and come up to me, one of the first things they say is, I love that brother and sister. And that to me says that it's more than a monster movie. Because yeah, we all love the monster. Of course, you gotta love the monster. But um, the human dilemma, you know, each story, each horror movie, this probably means you're getting old when you tell people what the rules are for what you need to do to make a horror movie. Um, there has to be humanity in each one, a human dilemma in each one. And I think that we do that in both Jeepers movies and we'll certainly do it in three. So yeah, I'm the luckiest man in the world, as I always say. Yes, I've had terrible things happen and I've, I've had terrible luck. I've also had wonderful luck and some of that was Jeepers one and two. And I'd like to thank everybody who made them possible, from Francis Coppola to MGM to um, Donnie and Ed and the wonderful cast and, uh, you know, Panicus and all the digital artists and stuff. It's such a huge family that comes together to make these movies that it feels a little bit uh, disingenuous for me to sit here and say, yes, these are the wonderful things I've done. I've had so much help, you know. And I'm just glad that there are people out all over the world, apparently, that just love these Jeepers movies, you know? More power to them, and I hope, uh, I hope 3 comes along and makes them happy again.